Okay, so there he goes. Well, today is Saturday morning, and we have Damadas and Anna here on the call, and I expect Kat and um, uh, Michael to join. Uh, and that um, I was just talking to uh, uh, Cathal last night, where he is at a Wat in northern Thailand, um, and that they see the Petita Samupada completely differently than the way that Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa. Now, Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa was actually transformational and that uh, his teachings have become widespread in Thailand. Now, um, to introduce the Petita Samupada, um, it's the, the way the mind works is the best way to describe it. And that, in fact, it's an, um, an explosion or an, um, a complete opening of the second noble truth, which is loba moha dosa, which means greed, ill will, and ignorance. Well, hello, Kat. Hello. Glad you could join. I'm glad we to be just, here. Hello, everyone. We were just talking about you. Today, the, uh, the topic is what we were discussing last night. What were we talking about? <laughs> well, oh, the teacher Salam Pada taking three lifetimes and that sort of thing. Yeah, okay, cool. Oh, all right. Now, uh, the uh, the Petita Samupada, which is translated into English as dependent origination, is actually an expansion of the second noble truth. And that you can see that easily under the point of what is the cause of dukkha is the second noble truth and it says specifically loha moha dosa which are actually also referred to as the three daughters of mara and that the three daughters of mara is greed ill will and ignorance and that's also the cause of dukkha so in this regard then dukkha is um the big item the big papa and that the support for that is greed ill will and delusion and petita samupada then if you see the dependent origination um aspects you see it's grounded in ignorance it's grounded in uh delusion and over time we we um let us say pick up our past along the way but we do it kind of ignorantly we're not actually when somebody gives you good advice for instance we'll either decide to take it or not take it without doing a full investigation of whether this is good advice or not like for instance pick up your toys learn your abcs do your one two threes and so the children begin to do what they're told to do and then they be continue to do what they're told to do without doing a complete investigation. I could see that, in fact, as I was a child, reflecting the pack on it especially, that um, because of a situation that happened when I was really, really young, that my mother was pregnant with my sister so that I know that I was uh, over three but under four years old, and I got into a competition with the church i recognized that my mom loved the church more than she loved me and that put me at odds with the southern baptist in general and because of that i would not take what the church was saying literally that i investigated i would get into arguments i would go and study the bible on my own etc like that but i found that i was the only one who did that and I visited because of our my dad moved around a lot I was in a lot of different churches including one of the biggest churches in the southeast uh, First Baptist Church of Charlotte we went there for a year as well as a lot of other smaller uh, churches and very very few people I guess one of the things about that would be that nobody who actually 
disbelieved what the Baptists were saying, made their children go to the Baptist church. My mom believed and made me go, but I did not take in what they were saying. I did not believe it. Um, I would argue with them on details and whatnot. And so um, the point that I'm making is, is that so many of the kids that I was raised with just accepted what they were told. They didn't don't have the skills to investigate and they didn't investigate. And I assumed that much of your, my other parts of my childhood were exactly that, that I just took what they said for granted without doing a thorough investigation of what I was learning. And so you can all appreciate that, that you picked up stuff over a long period of time that was not always true. In fact, it was, a lot of it was not true. Patriotism, God bless America. I pledge allegiance to the flag and all of that kind of stuff. Everybody just bought that hook, line and sinker. And nobody pointed out humanity. They all pointed out American. They pointed out statehood. Uh, and then in fact, uh, when I was <clears throat> growing up, there um, it started in 18, oh, excuse me, 1959. But every band that I was in, we would go from event to event to event that was re-celebrating the Civil War. It was a, it was a hundred years later, and the first one we went to was a um, a protest that happened in 1859 um, out in western part of South Carolina. <clears throat> and the spot that it happened was way out in the woods, and I remember all of the band students happened to get on this path one at a time to go down to the path and the, and the whole town and everyone was collected around to have that centennial celebration of the kickoff of uh, the war between the states. And then for the next four or five years, it was nothing but that. And so all the kids in the South in that time were highly doctrinated into uh, states' rights and uh, we're better than blacks and 10,000 other stupidities that uh, uh, the children of that time learned. But he, that happens also in Ireland, that the way that Irish history is presented to the kids is often not true. The history that we teach in school, not true, but we picked that up. And so much of the stuff that we picked up, including and the big one is how to live our lives, how to be happy, how to get along. And instead, we're taught competition. We're taught um, uh, tribalism and all kinds of things. And so the, pig, the students wind up living through that, picking all of that stuff up that is actually harmful as they're an adult. So but teacher Samapada and then the way that we gather our past is done ignorantly so that when we process new data, we do that ignorantly. Uh, and so uh, one of the things that can be said about the uh, Vasudhi Magas version of the Paticca Samapada is they say that it takes three lifetimes. Well, actually, that's true. It does take three lifetimes. And what are the three lifetimes that it actually takes is past, present, and future. Now, they talk about it in the sense of past lives, this present life, and future lives. But the reality is, is that the past doesn't have to go all the way back into hundreds or uh, years ago, centuries or whatever that you've got enough garbage collected in this lifetime <clears throat> to make your life trouble. And that the present moment is the time that we can do something about it. But the standard belief that has, um, let us say, infiltrated Buddhism from Hinduism 
is is that you can't do much of anything right now to get out of your troubles. You've got to wait until a future life. It's way off into the future. Hello, Michael. Glad to see. I knew that you'd join us as soon as you came onto the porch. <laughs> yeah, good to see everyone. All right. So, Cat then goes to a watch where they talk about it like this, uh, and that the kind of Buddhist practice that they have um, is called the contemplation of the 32 parts of the body. That's one of the things that you mentioned, Kat. Do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, I mean, that's, I actually literally um, uh, talked to Tanajan about um, the way I was taught. It, and I me even mentioned Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa. And the moment I mentioned Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa, he, he kind of like flung his head back and went like, oh no. He, he was like, uh, he was like, that's not right. And Ajahn Mun, he, he brought up Ajahn Mun about talking about, oh, Ajahn Mun says that past lives really doesn't mean a whole lifetime. That the Pachisaramata or Pachisamapada means it goes around in a whole one life. One cycle of birth comes from Avicca. It's not, it's not mind states going through mind states over and over and over. It's it's actually a whole body that you go into because of a vicha. And then I was like talking about, oh, well, doesn't craving come from the point of contact? Don't we end up in bhava because of craving from the point of contact? And he says, no, it's actually a lifetime. And Ajahn says there's aeons and aeons and aeons of lives that we go through these cycles. And it just, yeah, it is completely different than <laughs> how you were talking about it to me, about it being just from the point of contact. Okay, now, that belief system is possibly irrelevant. It's possibly irrelevant. Why? Because someone can believe in past lives and in future lives. They can believe in reincarnation and they can believe in what they believe is rebirth, but they're actually believing in reincarnation. That in fact, there's a major distinction between belief of reincarnation and the belief of Buddhist rebirth. But most people don't know the difference. <clears throat> now, the difference actually is pointed out in Sutta number 38, where the Buddha talks about that consciousness is dependently arising, just like all of the aspects of Paticca Samapada. Nothing happens unless it's dependent on something else. And the scientists have learned that the cause-effect cycle is so fast that we're not ever going to be able to record how fast the cycle of uh, cause and effect goes, because the cycle of effect of cause and effect actually causes the speed of light. It also causes the various frequencies of the speed of light. And that no matter how fast our cameras get down to a billionth of a second, that's still billions of times slower than the cause and effect. That in fact, a camera has a whole lot of bits and pieces to it, which means that it's got a whole lot of causes and a whole lot of effects. For, <clears throat> for instance, the light has to go through the lens and then it gets bent to form on the um, uh, uh, the little surface of digital stuff, um, uh, charge collectors, and that they can do that with various color filters, and then the electrical signals have to go to the computer and be processed. And so the, the highest speed camera has to have a huge number of cause and effect cycles going through it before it can record that first image, even though that image is only a billionth of a second. And another one, I, another frame. Go ahead, Kat. Ask you something about what you're saying. I remember you said, um, uh, I think one time you were talking about consciousnesses and you said it wasn't linear, linear in any sense, but it just happens so fast, comes in and out so fast that it seems like it's all um, it's going in some kind of time frame. And I was wondering, is that something that you 
experienced in in maybe a jhana or meditation in general that you were able to see that so up close that it you could see it just popping in and out or something like that rather than just the- yes and more to the point that you can begin when you're living your ordinary life once you practice correctly of being able to see what the mind's doing and pick up stuff you can begin to see how uh, that particular kind of stuff happens. I can give you several examples. One of them is catching something out of the corner of your eye. That some things happen really, really fast, but you pick it up. But most of the time, uh, people are slow. Um, Let's talk about it in the sense of reaction time. That there are uh, some sophisticated programs on the internet now that will have something like a red screen, and as soon as the green, the screen turns from red to green, you click your mouse, and it'll calculate how much time it took from the time that the screen was changed to the time that it clicked the mouse, and that's your reaction time. Now. We have to also take into effect uh, that some of the things that it's recording is is it actually takes some time for the screen to turn green. It doesn't do it instantly. It takes time for the computer to paint the screen, and also it takes some time for the, uh, the click of the mouse, the contact, to actually record in the software. And so there's some time that's lost immediately. And there's dip, it's difficult to calculate that because of all the different speeds of the various computers. Then, in fact, in the old, old days when games started happening, they would, um, the, the processors, the very early uh, Intel processors run, ran at uh, 4.77 megahertz. Well, when the computer sped up, the game that would take five minutes was now down to two seconds. It would go like that, and they had to put the timing into it because the processor speeds changed. <clears throat> so what we're really talking about is, is that we can catch stuff through our consciousness by training. And that one of the, the articles that I've read about um, um, reaction time is that some animals have very, very fast reaction times. Chickens can be very fast. Cats can be really fast, down to like um, 65 microseconds. Other animals like uh, the mongoose is down at about 50 uh, milliseconds reaction time. But when a human is measured, that normally is up at about 350 uh, microseconds. And that when people practice martial arts, a black belt would be down to about 200 microseconds. And then some of the world champions, um, Olympic stars, uh, grandmasters of karate would be down to about 180, maybe down to 170, which means that the best human being is only a third of the speed of your normal house cat. That's why they can catch mice and humans. That's hard to do because we're so slow. And part of the reason why the human mind is so slow is because it's got so much circuitry. It's got so much stuff to process. Um, So when we recognize that then the speed of things determines what we can actually uh, have as our consciousness, because some things can happen so fast. Here's an example of that, is is that on a regular basis here at the house, both Kat and uh, Michael have been here, they know that the door is open all the time, or almost all the time. And there have been times when I was in the bedroom, the whole family was in the bedroom, everybody was playing on cell phones or doing something or another, and a bird would fly into the room, circle around, find out that he was in a dead end, and then fly back out the door. And every time that happens, I'll notice it. But Tam and Kitty, they don't know that a bird's been in the room. They're not watching through their eyes. There's, there's a kind of training 
to be awake to what's happening in the eyes. And I would say that people who are sportsmen, for instance, um, uh, basketball players, you have to be really fast to catch what's happening because everybody else is really fast. That's the whole point. Many of the games have to do with how fast you are. And so there's a training involved with training in martial arts, training in sports that many, many people don't have any of. But when we take that kind of training and put it into the spiritual world, this is when things begin to um, allow us to then pick up on reality. We can pick up on what's happening in the mind really quickly. And so we can see what we're, we're actually thinking. This is part of the practice of start to watch the mind so that you can begin to see um, what's going on. An example of that is, is that somebody would say, oh, all of a sudden I just I was sitting in meditation. Everything is beautiful. And then I, and a, a panic attack, anxiety just popped right up. And the answer to that would be, well, what were you thinking? 25 milliseconds or 30 milliseconds before that. What was happening that kicked all of that stuff off? Because the Buddha says that the mind, oh monks, is really fast. He then makes the statement that he doesn't even have an analogy of how fast the mind is. Well, nowadays we do. Science has come in. Things have sped up a lot. And we do have some analogies. In fact, we're measuring it in milliseconds. So, um, the mind actually has cycles, and one of the cycles is called the alpha wave. And that alpha wave can be anywhere from, um, let us say, 14 cycles uh, per second down to about five cycles per second. And the idea is to let's speed that alpha wave up so that we can process and see things faster. And we can practice that. And the way that we practice that is by becoming acutely aware of sensory input. So that when something happens, you know it immediately. One of the games that I play with the dogs, and Lucky's the only one left around here right now, but it's still uh, the game mainly with her, is that I know somebody's in the yard before she does. When I say yard, it's a great big yard out to, out to the road about 50 meters. When the delivery people come, when the friends come home, when Tam comes around the corner, when I'm sitting here at this desk, my eyes are half attuned out so that I can see what's going on. And and uh, I often joke with uh, Lucky, oh, you're so slow because I've already seen what's happening before she gets up to go bark at it. Sometimes she checks she's she's faster, but generally I'm faster than she is to figure out what's happening out in the yard. This is all sensory input and yet magical thinking people will believe that this is called clairvoyance in the magical sense that you can see things at a distance. Yeah, you can see things at a distance if you're looking. <coughs> this is what clear vision really means is, is that you can see you can catch things as fast as they happen. An example of that is a breeze just blew up and that I could feel it on my skin even before the uh, backdrop behind uh, uh, Michael st started moving that curtain. You can see it's actually blowing the curtain behind him. Oh, hello, Ivan. Welcome. Hi. Hi. All right. So what a lot of the teaching of the Buddha is, is how fast we can stay in the present moment, can come into the present out of the past as soon as the present comes up. And yet much of the teachings of the Buddha, actually it's not the teaching of the Buddha, much of Buddhism has been infiltrated with this idea that everything is really, really, really slow. And that it takes lifetimes for anything to happen. And so they divide the Paticca Samuppada into definitely past lives 
from uh, and then present lives and then future lives as if the dukkha is going to be waiting for you after you die. Is the joke is is that the um, the comma machine will come dig you up out of your grave about 300 years from now just to kick you in the ass. And how he uses that is the physicians will hold the input up and slap them. I remember when that happened to me. There I was in my hot tub. It was nice and warm and gushy and everything was provided. And all of a sudden the earthquake happened. The bottom dropped out. And the next thing I know, Dr. Young has got me by the heels beating my ass. Well, I let out a yell so long and so loud that I didn't stop yelling until I was about 35 years old. That's, by the way, the time that I got to watch so and mode. And that's what happens with us is, is that stuff happens and we don't even know that it's happening. Very few people can remember what happened in their early childhood. And that this is one of the features that the Buddha talks about is to be able to remember what happens because you were there for it and you saw it. But if you're slow, you missed out on a lot of stuff. And so this is why Petitya Samapada starts off with ignorance and it winds up as dukkha. And right there, slap dab in the middle is our feelings of liking and not liking. So if you understand it correctly, you can see that the Petitya Samapada teaching is nothing more than a teaching of how the mind works that gets us into dissatisfaction, gets us into dukkha. And that it doesn't take three lifetimes. Now, one can believe in three lifetimes and it is irrelevant in the sense that they can still practice correctly right here, right now. They can speed things up. They can look at what's going on. They can make changes instantly. Um, An example of this, by the way, would be that the four-year-old child has no good coordination. So his dad takes him out in the uh, the yard and with a, with a small softball, he throws it underhanded and the four-year-old uh, will miss it and then he might catch it. And then he can catch it again and catch it again. And if he keeps practicing that and speeding that up so that he can catch balls, playing the sports, he can wind up being um, a pitcher or a catcher in the major leagues where they're throwing balls at 90 and 100 miles an hour and being able to catch them. All right. But most people, especially Thai, here's an interesting thing about Thailand, because they never learn to play catch and they've got a, um, an injunction against throwing things because throwing things seems to be violent. That you throw things at people in, in war. And so the Thai people are trained not to throw things. For instance, if I want to hand someone keys and they're only two feet away, because I was in the U.S. and trained with sports as a child, I would toss it in over to them. The Thai person can't catch keys from three feet away. Even when I'm lifting my hand up and down like this to show them I'm about to throw it, and I throw it, and the reaction time is so slow that they can't catch it. And so I've learned in Thailand that you got to hand somebody something because they can't catch it. They'll just stand there and let it hit them. So this is actually, again, part of that response time, part of the reaction time. Now, the reason that belief in rebirth becomes a hindrance is because we think that we've got plenty of time. You have heard the example that life is short, my friend. That's out of the Beatles tune. But what the belief is, is yeah, but you got a ton of them. You got plenty of lives. You got plenty of time. You can, um, you don't have to practice now. You can wait until the future and practice then. In other words, the belief in rebirth and reincarnation actually slows down the process of making big spiritual changes in one life. That in fact, people sometimes never change. They never grow because they believe that they can't 
because they believe in this um, reincarnation and rebirth. Now, going back to the point of consciousness, the Buddha talks about consciousness being dependently arisen. It depends upon circumstances. For instance, seeing the ball in the air, the human brain can actually calculate the trajectory of that ball, see where it's going to land, and a split second later, here's the hand there to catch the ball. If we train for that, also the same thing is true that if there is a um, unwholesome thought in the air, you can see the trajectory of that thought and catch it before it hits you. So when anxiety comes up, that means that the person was too slow to see the thought that brought on the anxiety. If we keep practicing, we can practice to get the mind quick. It has nothing to do with the age of the person who's practicing, and it has everything to do with can you keep watching? Can you keep looking? Can you remember to look at what's going on? Can you remember to keep your mind, your eyes open, the, both the physical ones and the mental eye, so that you can watch and you can see? But a lot of people are quite slow. And because of that, they think that they've got plenty of time. While in fact, they didn't. Those car keys hit them right in the face. Duca slams them right in the face. And they're too slow to see it. Too slow to catch it. So part of the practice of Anapanasati is to speed things up, to start practicing now to gain some speed so that we can um, move back and forth between things that, in fact, um, <clears throat> one of the problems with the uh, belief in rebirth and reincarnation is that it's me who is being reborn, that I live my life, I've got a soul, that soul is permanent unchanging and that when I die that soul will continue on that something about us is so strong and so permanent that it survives death and the Buddha teaches no the Buddha teaches in fact that um, whatever it is that moves from life to life is not consciousness because even as you're alive right now your consciousness is dependently arising, depending upon the circumstances right here, right now. Then, in fact, the easy way to see it is, is that you're unconscious when you're asleep. When you go to sleep, you've got different kind of thoughts and feelings than when you wake up the next morning. So you're not even the same person after you uh, wake up. You're a different person now with different thoughts, different feelings, etc. And yet we have this belief system um, that's in all religions that Christians, in fact, believe that you're broken by some original sin that happened long ago. And because of that, you need Jesus. You can't do it on your own. Well, that same belief is actually part of the people who believe in rebirth and reincarnation that you can't do it in this life. You're going to have to wait until circumstances are better. You're going to have to make it easy. And so you will be born in the next life, depending upon the good deeds that you did in this one. This is why we have in Thailand, Tom Boone. Now, you could go so far as to say that um, we have three different views then. In, uh, and especially among the monks, there are those views of rebirth, reincarnation exists. The people need to do their ceremonies and they need to do their um, tambun and uh, uh, generosity in order to have a better next life. And then you'll have Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa's position, which is kind of over at the other extreme of 
No, none of that stuff is true. That what you need to do is practice generosity now for the benefit of getting the generosity now. But there are some noble monks in Thailand, I've seen them actually in the United States, who when people go to these ceremonies and want to uh, practice Tambun, the noble monks let them knowing that it's a bunch of bullshit, that they're not getting any value of it, that they're doing it out of a sense of obligation and duty, and they're not getting any joy out of it. They're sort of doing it for future. That oh, it's going to cost me so much money to build that building, but somehow or another I can put up with doing that now so that I can gain some benefit way off into the far future. And a lot of monks will let them do that. But Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa was the kind of monk who says no. And because of that, he would not perform any ceremonies. He would not do that kind of stuff. I was in actually a um, a quandary about it in in the U.S. going to all of these ceremonies, knowing that the value of the ceremony was not as beneficial as the people thought, because they weren't getting a lot of value out of it right then and there. So I, my compromise was to make sure that people had great joy when they were doing those ceremonies, because that's the whole point of it. But I can see that um, for some people, rebirth and reincarnation is a big hindrance to their practice. The big hindrance to the practice is that, oh, I can't do anything about it now. I'm going to have to wait for my next life and times will be better then. Well, guess what? If there is a next life, it probably will be an ordinary life, just like the life that you've got right now is an ordinary life. And so in the next life, they'll have the opinion, well, I'm going to have a lot of lives left. Why should I practice now? Let me wait and do some Tom Boone and make merit and whatnot, and then next time I'll have a better life. That's the cycle of samsara. <clears throat> that's the wheel and the teaching of the Buddha is to learn to come out of that cycle now here's the point about those cycles we can think of it in the sense of uh, past lives and future lives and hundreds and maybe century hundreds of years along and that uh, we're reborn only to have that same cycle going on right but the reality is, is that those cycles happen very quickly. They happen right here in this life. We can actually see some of the cycles going on. An example of the cycles would be um, an information. Way back when, before writing was ever invented, lives were primitive. Humans didn't have any capability of gaining any knowledge. And so everyone was stupid because they had no teachers, they had no writing, they had no way of uh, collecting data or anything. And then the Sumerians come up with curiforms and all of a sudden now they can keep track of how many sheep they've got, they can keep track of what plots of land are uh, planted with what uh, goods, uh, they can keep track of the, uh, the cycles, and yet the, the writing was very difficult to do. It took a highly skilled professional to do the writing, and if he was going to duplicate something, it would take him weeks or months. And that system kept going even for old Bibles. They even had that idea for the old Buddha scriptures, that the scriptures of the Buddha were precious. They were highly precious. Why? Because it would take a month, months or years to reproduce just one copy. But at least we had writing. And that was a major revolution. And people started to learn. Well, fast forward to the 1400s and the Gutenberg Press 
And to now things are sped up because we now can print the same book over and over and over again and start distributing uh, information. And so it was a major revolution. And by the way, that major revolution was part of a hundred years war. It was the um, the enlightenment or the waking up of science uh, and breaking it uh, the Catholic Church into various groups, including Protestantism and science. We're going through that same kind of revolution now, 400 years later, maybe five, a hundred years, in the sense of the internet and computers, so that now everyone is capable of getting a, 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 a very high quality education, but there's a whole lot of people who are trying to prevent that from happening. Why? Because they want the old beliefs to stay. But in fact, in the town that I graduated from high school, only a very, very few people after they graduated from high school left town. Nobody, none of the parents wanted their children to leave, especially didn't want them to go to some big university because they're at the university. They're going to learn stuff that we don't believe in. And so they didn't want their kids. I, uh, have you seen that still in Tulsa, Michael? Where the Christians don't want their kids to go to university? Yes, especially among the fanatics. But now they have uh, Christian colleges. So uh, there's more of an effort to push people towards towards that sort of thing. Like ORU, Oral Roberts. Mm-hmm. Oh, and there's an old Oral Roberts joke. Way back when, uh, people would buy uh, uh, records, you know, vinyl uh, long play records, uh, and, and Oral Roberts had quite a business going, but it kind of fell apart because by the time that the records arrived at somebody's address, the hole in the middle of the record had healed. <laughs> So anyway, um, that kind of belief system actually then prevents people from gaining real knowledge. And so people who believe in rebirth and reincarnation, they don't want their children to learn the right, the reality. They want them to keep them away from it because that might prove daddy wrong. And so the old belief systems are going to hang around for centuries. The question is, are you going to spend your time investigating what's real and what's not real? And you look at things going on and see that your opportunities for change are not in the next lifetime. Your opportunities to change are right now. They also have the idea that they can't change, that it has to wait until circumstances are right, that the circumstances will do it. An example of that is Vipassana, that people can have insights into Dukkha, but the only insight that you need is that this is Dukkha. This is unsatisfying. Let's change right now to something satisfying. But they have the idea that, oh, no, we have to have deep insight because this, these problems are deep. It may take lifetimes and you have to have really deep understanding of um, dukkha. <clears throat> and so my playful example of that is imagine that you're walking down a sidewalk and right in front of you, four or five feet in front of you, <coughs> is a, a pile of uh, dog do. Now, one wet method to handle that is just to parade right along. You see the dog do, but you don't care about it, and you step right in it. You got it all over your foot. This is how people live their lives. The way that the Buddha would practice this is to see that dog do and walk, step around it, walk around it. But the Vipassana or the religious people will say, oh, this is dog do. We've got to know it very well so that we can avoid it later. Let's pick it up, take it into our kitchen, 
dissect it, put it in the blender, um, uh, powder it, bake it, fry it, and make sure that we understand what dukkha is, and then we can do something about it. And the answer is you don't need to do any investigation. You don't need that kind of investigation. You need a very quick investigation just immediately to discover that that's dukkha, and then we can avoid it right then and there. And so this is the real practice of Paticca Samapada is to understand that the past was as you were walking up to that uh, dog pile. And the present is to step around it. And the future is to go along happily, watching where you're going for the next one. That's the real way of doing it. But the way that people have it now is the past is approaching that dog doodle and then the present is stepping at it and now your future is you've got to spend all of that time dealing with that dukkha, but you can't take it off your shoe because you're not supposed to. You're not supposed to get rid of it. You can't, in fact, get rid of it. You need some comma machine, you need some circumstances, you need some plastic Jesus, you need something that we all have that kind of mentality. This is called a victim's mentality that I can't do it myself and I can't do it right now. And so we look for someone else or something else on the outside, like making merit in Thailand or donating to the church in the U.S., or doing something so that you can get a better future. But right now is not good enough. And so right now we're still in Dukkha. Is that your choice? Is to plan for the future so that someday, way out in the future, someday your prince is going to come? Or can you can become your own prince right now? And you do that right now. Now, normally we have the idea that, oh, I can't do it. I need help. And when we find out that we're really not going to get any help, you're either going to do it for yourself or you're going to be stuck in your dukkha. Whether you are religious, whether you're Buddhist, whether you're waiting for the future uh, lives or whether you're waiting for some God in heaven or whatever you're waiting for, right while you're waiting, you're in discomfort, dissatisfaction, you're in dukkha. And so when we find out that nothing's going to get us out of the dukkha, the next thing that we can do then is to recognize, are you up to the task? Are you still a victim, only you've got no support at all? Or are you going to stop being a victim and recognize that you yourself are capable of coming out of your own dukkha? that you can do that. Are you capable of it? That's the second kind of doubt. And then within our practice, once we begin to see that I can come out of it, that's the real spiritual growth into not only am I capable of doing it sometimes, but no matter how much the mind gets hindered, no matter what kind of difficulties or what kind of um, uh, obstructions that I have in the moment, I can come out of that. I can come out of it because I've got a method. And what is the method? The Eightfold Noble Path, that's the method. And this is the third level of doubt, and that is, is that not only can I do it, but I've got a method to do it. I've got the Dhamma. And this is why the, uh, the doubt is referred to in uh, the teaching of the Buddha <coughs> as the third fetter, the fetter of doubt. And that fetter of doubt has three aspects. One is... Who am I going to get to fix me? Because I can't do it. The second level of doubt is I can do it myself. And then the third level of doubt is we've got a method that works. And when we can come to that place, this is actually when we get really gung-ho about the Dhamma. Yeah, 
as long as I'm paying attention to the Dhamma, as long as I'm paying attention to reality, I can stay out of Dukkha right here, right now. And so we begin to get uh, dedicated to looking at what's going on. This is when we begin to enter the stream of the Dhamma. The entry of the stream of the Dhamma is when that's the only thing that really matters, is to pay attention to what's going on. Develop. Keep your mind open. Keep watching. Keep looking. And uh, the amount of dukkha that you have to deal with then subsides. It goes down tremendously. Because why? Because every time it starts to come up, I've caught it. I can see it. I don't have to dwell in it. I don't have to uh, smear it all over my face. I can see that dukkha and I can avoid it immediately. This is the real teaching of the Buddha. And yet you can see how much of actual Buddhism is affected by the old belief systems of rebirth, reincarnation, which are actually affected by that doubt of who can I get to help me? Oh, I've got to get the comma machine to help me. I've got to go build up some good merit so that the comma machine will finally give me a life where I can uh, become enlightened without having to put up any effort to it. This is uh, what they believe in with the the, uh, <clears throat> the pure land or uh, Amitabha or Maitri, the future Buddhas, uh, the Buddha of the West. The Buddha of the West is supposed to make things so easy that everybody can come enlightened. Well, if that's the case, then you could say that uh, Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa has become the Buddha of the West because he has shown that actually is easy. The only distinction is you cannot wait for future to get it done. You got to do it right now. And when you do it right now, it becomes easy to do right now, especially when we develop the skills to do it. So the time for my tree, the time for the pure land, this is the pure land. Why? Because you're capable of solving your own problems. You can come out of your dukkha. You can do that. How do we do that? It's by practicing over and over again. And as we practice, we begin to see what the mind is doing and we can start catching it very quickly so that it doesn't, um, let us say, bring up tension or anxiety or if we see that we've got tension and anxiety, we can deal with it really easy. Oh, I feel tense. Let me just relax. And then a breath or two later, and we're back out of it again. So anxiety that used to plague people, and they don't even know it. And then when they begin to start meditating, they begin to see how much they're plagued with it. Now, anxiety doesn't come up very often. And when it does, it's really easy to deal with. And sometimes it's very rarely that it comes up because we found a way to lead an easy life. And that easy life is available. That pure land is available right here, right now. It's not way off into the future. We don't have to wait for Maitri. He's here. You don't have to wait for Amitabha. He's here. You're looking at him. You're looking at yourselves. You can see all of these people. Here's the Abhitabha. Or uh, the other word for it is Amido, the Amido Buddha. Making things really easy, bringing in the pure land. The future is already here now. It's not way off into the future. The only reason why we uh, so many still believe it's way off into the future is because they believe that they can't do it by themselves. They've got to wait for the comma machine. That in fact, I've seen it. it uh, it's, it's like this. Is that people will say, oh, I put in 30,000 hours of meditation. And somebody else will say, oh, well, I put in 100,000 hours of meditation. And they're both in the idea of that someday the comma machine is going to waltz into the meditation hall, spread his Shakti pot, and then they can feel happy. 
after they put in all of those hours of meditation and put in all of that work. And the answer is, is that they didn't have to put in all of those hours waiting for something to happen. They could have put in all of those hours in great joy because they made it happen right from the beginning. Your choice. Are you going to make a choice to choose to be happy right now? Are you going to wait for the events to be correct? And this is the reason why uh, <clears throat> the real noble teachings of the Buddha have spread in society so slowly. They've been kept alive because there's always people who are capable of seeing this and becoming noble. So we've always had noble but they've been so few of them. Part of the reason there's been so few of them is because the, the knowledge of how to become free has become obscured, it's become buried. Well, guess what? Just like Gutenberg's press and now the internet, the teachings of the, of the Buddha are available to you. All you have to do is apply it right now. This is all we need to do is to keep practicing just like that four-year-old boy paying ball with his dad. He keeps catching that ball, and pretty soon he can catch one running at 100 miles an hour. In fact, he can catch arrows out of the air. And if he's in a Matrix movie, he can even dodge bullets. Why? Because we've been practicing. Now, in fact, insults are is about as fast as a bullet. Can you dodge insults? Can you get out of the way of them? Most people, when they get insulted, they stand as a target. Oh, that's me he's talking about, rather than saying, went right by me. That wasn't me. He was talking about somebody else. He was insulting someone else. So you can dodge bullets. You can dodge criticism. You can dodge arrows. You can catch the ball if you practice. And this is what we need to do then, is to practice over and over and over again of just getting out of the way. Just getting out of the way is all we need to practice. And the best thing to do is to get out of the way of your own unwholesome thoughts. Step aside. Let them pass. And if we can do that, we can have a happy life. You already live in the pure land. You already have the Buddha of the West. You carry him around in your mind. So good luck, everybody. Be here now. Practice diligently, and you don't have to wait for centuries to be happy. You can do it right now. Michael, do you have anything to say? Uh, this is wonderful and very well put. Uh, we don't need tomorrow, don't need another life. We can just practice right now. Mm -hmm. Damadas. Brother of oh, the Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much for uh, that. That was really awesome. How about you, Anna? Can you do it now? Excellent. How about you, Ivan? You can do yes. it. Yes. Yes, that's the attitude. The attitude <laughs> has to change from, oh, poor me, I need help, into, I could do this. I'm the winner. I'm the emperor of my own pile of dirt. I can handle this. It's all a matter of an attitude change. We create ourselves dukkha because we think that we have no choice. But when we recognize that we do have a choice, we can have a marvelous life. I welcome you all to your own pure land. I welcome you all to become the emperor of your own polydor. Living on top of the world is your choice. So, does anybody have any final points to make? Go ahead, Michael. Yes, I'd uh, like to invite anybody who's listening online or anybody who's here today 
to uh, make sure and check out opensongoffoundation.org. And if you're interested in volunteering in any way, we definitely have some uh, ways in which you can volunteer, such as with the website or with our YouTube channel or even on our Discord. So please reach out to me or DJ or Domerado and we can uh, help get you set up if you'd like to volunteer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I would like to have volunteers for is to use the website. We have forums, join a forum, post in the forums. We have a messaging system, start messaging each other. Then in fact, eventually we want the Open Sangha Foundation to kind of take over all of the ways because Buddhists are messaging with Reddit and with uh, Discord and on Skype and on YouTube and on uh, Facebook. And we can gather huge numbers of people together to start messaging on uh, our Buddhist site, the Buddhist site, the open site for all from Mahayana, Theravada, Nichiren, Pure Land, Chan, Zen, everything is all available because we, we need to build a community. A lot of people in the West have the idea of, oh, that Zen is better than Theravada. Oh, Mahayana, that's the It's Kadits. But Theravada, they like to read books, you know, and so we have all of this sectarianism and the real point is, is that all of the, the various Buddhisms have one quality, and that is, is that we can come out of suffering right now. We can stop hurting. But in fact, that's what you could say that the Buddhism is all about, is to stop hurting. You don't have to wait for centuries to stop hurting. You can stop hurting right now. And we can work together, and it doesn't matter what kind of... Um, labels that you put on the teachings of the Buddha. The teaching of the Buddha is there in all traditions. All the traditions have the same quality, and that is to come out of our suffering right now. And yet all of the traditions are infiltrated with the older ways of, oh, you can't do it. Oh, you're not able to do it. Oh, you need help. You need a plastic Jesus on the dashboard of your truck. Oh, you need to get baptized. Oh, you need to do this kind of ceremony. You need to take the triple gem. You need to do the precepts and all of the ceremonial stuff, hoping that someday in the future that will help us out. But the real teaching of the Buddha is now. Do it right now. Come out of your problems right now. Become happy right now. That's the real teaching of the Buddha, and that's available on all levels in all of the various traditions. And so we can start to merge those. Then, in fact, that's the real pure land is when all of these various Buddhisms all over the place come together in this one single perspective is that is everyone can be happy right now if they put in the right effort. Ivan, do you have any comment to make? No, it's just this is wonderful. I I start I start to understand the subtlety of the teaching more and more. And that's all. Hi, Dad. You came back just in time to say goodbye. We talked about you the whole time while you were gone. <laughs> I'll be sure to uh, eavesdrop on the recording anyway. But yeah, my battery ran out, so that sucks. It was on like fast charge, where they just charge it up, but it dies in like a minute, <laughs> 10 minutes or something. So. All right. Did you, uh, did you finish up on, um, or what was like the kind of, I suppose, uh, finishing talk on the dependent origination in terms of like how how yeah like what what do what would you say to someone who's like oh 
dependent origination is just dependent on the body breaking up and coming into birth again. And then actually, no, we say it's the I mind. wouldn't even bother with it like that. I would say offhand that the way to handle people who believe in Christianity, oh, well, you're going to suffer the normal deeds and living that you're going to all people have. And then when you go to heaven, then you'll feel good. Is that the way that you look at it? Why don't you have your heaven right here, right now? So the same thing with those people who believe in uh, rebirth, reincarnation in the sense of the Petitia Samapada. Oh, you got to do the investigation of the body. You got to contemplate the body. And the answer to that is, yeah. How long are you going to contemplate the body for 10 lives, 20 lives? Why don't you contemplate the body happily right now? Why do you want to wait to have a better life next time when you can, in fact, make your life enjoyable right here, right now by taking the right effort? Right now. This is what Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa teaches. Now. What Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa teaches actually applies for rebirth and reincarnation believers also. The difficulty is, is that they believe that they have to wait because they can't do it now. But if you believe you can do it now, even if rebirth and reincarnation exists, why don't we have a happy life now and then have a next happy life? And then the one after that will have a happy life then too. Why do I have to have an unhappy life now in order to have the hope that I'll have a happy life three, four, five, six lifetimes from now? Why should I wait six lifetimes to be happy? I can be happy in this life. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Let's do it now. You can do it now. And that's what you can tell these guys, even these old monks, is that, okay, you can wait. Just like Maitri, remember Achan Maitri is saying he's hoping for a better life next time. The answer to that is, well, why don't you have one right now? I was uh, I was curious about, um, can you, if you have the strong enough, I guess, sati, can you actually see the moment that you go from one life to the one life to the next life in terms of mindset? Like, can you catch the actual ending and rebirth? If we're talking about mindsets, can you see it? Well, How let us put it this way. I missed it last time. <laughs> but I'm not going to miss it this time. That last moment, I'm waiting for it, man. I'm going to be ready for you. All right, what is death? Let me look at it. Let me see it. I want to see that light. I want to see my grandman me say, oh, you can't come now. And I'm going to say, yes, I am, Granny. Here I am. I'm dead. I'm dead and loving it. I want to see what's going on. Unfortunately, I don't think like everybody else, I'll be able to report back. But if I can send a celestial email, I will. <laughs> but I'm quick enough now. I, I'm, I'm ready for it. I want to see what death is like. I've practiced well. I'm ready for it. Now it's just a matter of hanging out, waiting for it, watching for it mindfully. Be fast. Because it doesn't take long to die. Nobody comes back. They always go forward. So, let's finish this talk. Anybody get any last things to say? All right. Well, I'm I'm dead meat. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. See you guys. Take care.